All right. Well, welcome everybody to another YouTube Live success story with a TTP student. Uh, I'm Ben Resnick. I'm a TTP Live Teach instructor. Really excited to be here with Jacob to hear his success story. Uh, pretty amazing story. Uh, first try, 770, uh, Q49, V49. And uh, excited to jump in uh, to that. But just real quick intro on myself. I've been a GMAT expert uh, specialist since 2016 and currently the uh, live teach instructor. And I uh, really think everyone's gonna learn a ton from hearing Jacob's story, all his insights. And uh, yeah, definitely put any uh, questions as they come up in the chat. So, uh, oh yeah, one last thing too is, uh, you know, please uh, like and comment, um, you know, any questions you have or, or any things you noticed uh, about the call that you found helpful. So. Uh, yeah, let's first start off by uh, Jacob telling us about your background and what motivated you to get started on this journey. Yeah, sounds good. Uh, so hello, everyone. My name is Jacob. Uh, so I just graduated last year from the University of Illinois uh, in Urbana-Champaign. Uh, studied business administration there, focused in supply chain management. Um, so I started studying for the GMAT my senior year of school. Uh, sort of my strategy came from hearing a lot of advice from uh, folks I was working with in my internship who were like, oh, wow. I really wish I'd studied for this test like back when I was in school, kind of in the mode of studying and that whole frame of mind. So that was something I was getting a lot of advice about. So I figured I'll just start my prep really early, try to get this test done out of the way, even though I didn't really have any super specific MBA plans at the time. I knew it was something I wanted to do. Um, so I figured I'd just kind of try to get a score. I knew it was going to be valid for a few years. So I tried to, to get it done sort of as early as possible. Um, so yeah, like I said, I graduated last year. Now I'm working as a supervisor at a industrial supply distributor uh, here in Chicago, Illinois. Nice. Well, that's awesome to get it out of the way early. And uh, yeah, how long was your, let's let's walk through the details of the process of uh, how you found the TTP course and how long you spent on it and your process throughout. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Uh, so basically my process started by, I just took the GMAT like totally blind, just wanted to get a sense of like, where am I starting from? What's my like total baseline score? Um, and then from there, uh, once I kind of knew what I was looking at, I started shopping around, looking at all the different prep courses. This was a while ago, so I don't totally remember what like all the different ones I looked at were, but I was doing some pretty comprehensive, like looking all over the internet for all my different options. Um, and you know, honestly, when I first found TTP, I was a little skeptical because I thought the price seemed like really low compared to a lot of the other services. So I was like, could this be the same thing? Um, but I found a lot of really great reviews online and decided to give it a shot and uh, ended up working really well for me. So I was happy with what I found. That's awesome. Yeah, that's great. And then what was your that uh, starting mock so people have a sense of where your starting point? Yeah, so my first score was a 650. I think it was a 34 quant and 46 verbal. Um, so yeah, as you could tell, like my quant score is really what I needed to work on. So that was where I focused like the vast majority of my studying. That's great. That's great. And how did you feel? I mean, that is quite a good starting score, especially on the verbal. How, what was your initial reaction in terms of like, uh, you know, how you felt about it? I was pretty happy with that. I felt like um, I was like, if that's my score without having done any prep, um, I felt like, you know, if I put in work for a good amount of time, I'd be able to come away with a really solid score. Um, so I was I was happy with that result. I honestly did not expect to do that well. At the time, I didn't really have a good understanding of GMAT scores and what was like what I was really aiming for. But once I started doing some research into, OK, what does the score actually mean um, and getting a sense of it, I was like, OK, this is a, a very solid starting point. So I was happy with it. That's cool. Do you feel it helped a bit to take it right out right out of school where you're more used to doing like tests and things? Definitely. Um, I definitely understand now that I'm in the, the working world, I understand why that advice was given so frequently. It's just a very different frame of mind, I guess. And, you know, the fact that I was in school spending so much time studying anyway in, you know, taking tests wasn't something out of the ordinary for me at that point. Um, so it definitely kind of just fit more into my my daily routine and stuff like that. So I think that was a, a very good plan, at least for me personally. Right. That's really good. Yeah, and that's great advice. And I would say for the people that are, you know, farther along and it has been longer, that can be an adjustment period. But just, you know, stick with it. Uh, definitely helps to have an organized program. Right. And. So you so you're not, you know, all in the wind, like even my me for, you know, trying to go through all the resources, even as a background as a tutor, when I wanted to get in the GMAT, it's like can be overwhelming if you don't have a program. So definitely, um, yeah, creating that discipline helps a lot. And getting into that topic, like what was your structure in terms of how many hours a day or a week over how long of a period? And yeah. I think you might have mentioned, you know, a couple breaks along the way or, or how, how did that all, uh, you know, pan out? 
Yeah. So also another part of the reason why I wanted to start studying early was because I just preferred to have like a less intense weekly load and just kind of study over a longer period of time, um, which I felt was just like a little bit more manageable from the perspective of like motivating myself to study. Uh, but also I thought that would be a good strategy just to like retain information. Like I felt like if I wasn't cramming into a smaller period of time, I'd have an easier time kind of remembering all of these concepts I was trying to review or pick up. Um, so really, I mean, it fluctuated a bit over the year in total that I was studying, but I'd say generally I was only spending like a couple hours a week, um, actually studying, uh, as you mentioned, I did take a couple breaks throughout my, my process. So after I graduated, I took a month and was, was traveling around Europe. And so I wasn't doing any studying during that trip. And then right when I started work at first, uh, that was like a pretty hectic time, uh, trying to get adjusted to like a new, uh, company and moving and all that stuff. So I wasn't really studying at that point either. Uh, so I would say I was studying over the course of about a, a little over a year, but I wasn't necessarily doing studying 100% of that year. Right. Got it. Got it. And did you find like sometimes people, it varies person to person on whether the breaks, you know, the right amount of time for a break. And if it's, um, you know, we've often seen if you're going pretty hard, but then like you get frustrated, you take a big break. That's that's too much. Right. Rather just mm -hmm. get the test out of the way. But then at the same time. You don't want to, uh, you know, burn out, and you have to handle certain things like the new job. So, for you, did did you notice like um, having to get back on it was a challenge at all, or or you can tell us about that challenge or any other challenges along the way? It's always uh, yeah. interesting. Yeah, I think there were sort of two sides to that coin. There was definitely an aspect of like when I came back from taking um, a little bit of time off from studying, I had to. There was a lot of concepts, especially with quant, that I like just was like, what was I doing here again? Like I don't really remember. It, it took a bit to kind of like pick things back up. But I think in the long term, having had that experience of like, I learned this stuff for the first time, went away from it, it came back and kind of relearned it. Like it all came back a lot quicker. And I feel like I retained it a little more thoroughly because it was not the first time I was revisiting some of these concepts. Um, so although it was a little bit of a pain in the immediate and I was like frustrated that like, oh, I'm spending all this time revisiting stuff I already covered. I really just want to move on in the program and kind of get this test over with. So it was a little frustrating from that perspective, but on the other hand, I do think it helped me in the long run in terms of just retaining all the information I was taking in. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, and review. Uh, one thing I often see is that, yeah, that like that what you were saying about people forgetting things. I mean, that is a natural progress uh, pro process there. And you know, I often see people not doing enough review. I have this mantra. I often encourage people to review, reflect, redo. And I'd be curious of like what your review process was like, if you tended to review questions you missed. Um, mm -hmm. You know, there, there's a, a lot of features in the course that, you know, there's a lot to get through and maybe not every feature people even knows about or uses, but there's, you know, uh, these analytics, right? Of, uh, uh, you know, you're targeting certain topics that you're weaker on, custom tests to redo mistakes, um, uh, flashcards, and kind of curious what, what you found helpful and what you did in terms of reviewing and trying to refresh on topics you're weaker on. Yeah, totally. I'd say I mostly use like the chapter tests. Like I would just kind of go back through each of the chapters um, and do those end of chapter tests. Um, and I guess something that I liked about that was that you could see, I would review the questions that I missed, of course, and then you could see like what specific part of the chapter that question had to do with. Um, so that made it easier to like not have to go back and review the whole chapter, but just kind yeah. of like take the test, see what aspects of the chapter I was struggling with, and then just go back and review those specifically. Um, so that was something that I, I guess I appreciated from the course. Oh, that's great. Yeah, that's what I think one of the consistent themes we've heard that I found most helpful doing the course too. Uh, yeah, I actually took it to get to help me get up to the, my 780 in 2020. And definitely like having the tags at the bottom. Um, super nice. Yeah, to be efficient with the prep. Uh, yeah, that's a great point, I think. Um, and not having to review everything. <laughs> so yeah, we, hear that, we, hear, we hear that a lot. And then it sounds like, you know, I mean, you started out a pretty good point where there I would say like uh, any like anxiety around anything or or psychological challenges. I mean, people are at different points with that, you know, in yeah. terms of how how uh, how much stress it is. Right. Some people take things really hard, like, oh, no, this practice test. And, you know, as a, as a teacher, I always have to encourage people like, hey, it's not always a straight line. You know, it's great if it is. But right. Like mm -hmm. it can it can go up and down a little bit. So any uh, thoughts on that? I would say one of the challenges for me was like I really didn't want to take the test twice. Like I was like, I want to take this test and just like get it over with and not have to come back to it. Um, and so towards like the end of my prep, I was trying to figure out like, okay, at what point do I just go and take this test? And like, obviously I'm not gonna be 100% perfect on all the practice tests I'm taking. Um, so it was a little hard for me to figure out like, at what point do I just say, okay, I'm gonna go do it. Um, Cause I just kind of kept pushing back and back. I was like, I wanna prep more and just, you know, get the best score I possibly can. Um, 
So eventually I just had to kind of say, I'm going to set a deadline for myself. I scheduled a test a couple months in advance and I was like, I'm just going to, I'm going to take it at this time, um, no matter how prepared I am and see how it goes. But at a certain point, I just need to like pick a day and stick to it. Um, so that was what I ended up doing, but it was a little challenging for me to figure out at what point do I like end prep and just go take the test. Totally. Yeah. That's definitely a common challenge. And a lot of times we even see anxiety about even taking that first test. It sounds like you just jumped in right away, which is definitely something I encourage. Um, another thing we often encourage is taking the practice test as a good gauge and then scheduling once you're like in the range or even above that target score, um, you know, at or above is often a good time to like schedule that test. Um, or even if you've taken two tests that are in the range, you know, then you have a higher chance. But because um, it is, you know, you, you may come in, do a little better on the actual test. It's not the most common to like get super lucky and, and go like, you know, 50, 100 points higher than you're, you're, you've been scoring on practice tests. Mm -hmm. So I guess I'd be curious for you, um, where, what was your situation with practice tests on when you took them? Um, there's the six, six official tests on GMAT.mba.com. Mm -hmm. um, Yes, I think I did in total just three of those tests. Um, I really just like, it was hard for me to find the motivation to sit down and like crank out a whole practice test since they do take a long time. So I did the one at the very beginning to get my baseline score. And then I did a couple towards the end of my prep just to kind of get, like you were mentioning, like an idea of where I thought I would score um, and to try to see like, am I actually ready to take this? Um, so yeah, one thing I guess that was a little challenging about that was trying to actually like simulate the test environment, which I didn't really try to do. But like when I took my last practice test, I did it at a library and I was like, this is a very different experience than what it's going to be like on test day. And I didn't 100% know what the actual test day would look like. Um, so that was a little bit of a challenge for me. I was like trying to like not listen to music or anything just so I could kind of be as realistic as possible. But I also had in the back of my mind, like, I'm not sure how this is going to compare. So I was kind of expecting that I would do a little bit worse on the real test because of that aspect compared to the last practice test I did. But it actually ended up being the opposite for me. I think I, like the last practice test I took, I got a 750 and then on the actual GMAT, I got a 770. Um, and I think that was partially because my response to the, I guess, anxiety that the test day environment provoked was actually kind of beneficial to me. Um, it just helped me kind of like focus in a little bit more. So that was not exactly what I was expecting. Um, but that was definitely like a, an, an aspect of the test I was considering towards the end. Yeah, that's an awesome point. And I love that you said that because like there's this idea and there's been studies on this to use the anxiety to your advantage. So like there's this idea of an ideal activation level, which for maybe the average person is like a six out of 10. Um, so like we don't necessarily have to think about anxiety or, or the stress of the test as being a negative thing. Uh, instead, if we can reframe that as excitement, then like we can use that adrenaline and those, uh, you know, the, all the, um, uh, the, all this, you know, blood to our brain in a healthy way, right? Um, if it's too activated, then, you know, we want to do some breathing exercises, the physiological size. There's actually one I've been doing like a three sniffs in and then uh, sit out. Mm. So there's a lot of these techniques that are really helpful or just a diaphragmatic breathing, um, belly breaths. Um, but I, yeah, definitely. I love that, that you were able to channel like the adrenaline a little bit into uh, performing higher. And, uh, you know, that's, that sounds great that you were able to get that 750 and then, you know, feel good going into the, into the test. Um, yeah. Were there any, like, uh, in terms of mindset things, routines you had before the test? Um, I know you said you wish you had simulated a little better. I definitely encourage that in general, um, you know, the markers and everything, um, mm -hmm. but having a good routine beforehand. Um, but uh, yeah, any thoughts on the day of and or any breathing exercises, getting in the mindset, um, warm up questions. There's lots of things people do and, you know, whatever, whatever you did obviously worked, but uh, curious, curious how you approach that. Yeah, I guess I didn't really have that specific of a routine. Um, on the actual test day, um, I took a half day off work because it was like a weekday afternoon that I had scheduled. Um, so I had a few hours beforehand to just kind of do some like last minute prep. So I tried to like not cram too much. Like I wanted to be pretty relaxed and just kind of maybe get a little bit more confidence going in. So I just did kind of my very last review, did a couple of like questions that uh, had been consistently giving me a hard time throughout my prep. Um, just to kind of feel like as confident as possible. I knew I wasn't really going to learn anything new in that couple of hours immediately before the exam that I hadn't already known. But I was like, if I can just feel like I'm 100% sure about these couple concepts that are still giving me some trouble, um, that'll help me feel a little bit more confident actually going into the test. Um, so yeah, I guess that is sort of a routine um, to try to alleviate some of the anxiety that I was feeling going in. Yeah, that, that makes sense. And that's something we hear a lot is a little bit of warm up can, can get the brain moving. Um, another thing is 
I often see or have studied is, uh, you know, give yourself some time to wake up. Um, one study said like average person, you know, is way more alert, like three hours after. So um, with the online one, the advantage is you can, you know, you have generally a lot of leeway. And when you schedule it, um, it sounds like the afternoon worked great for you. Um, so yeah, definitely something to consider for other folks is, you know, what time do you want to take it? What's your ideal time? And then um, I, you may or may not have done this. I know you said you you like the idea of, of trying to simulate on the practice test as much as possible. Did you try to take it at the same time or, or simulate in any way? I think I think you may have said there's some of that you wish you did a little, uh, a little could, room for improvement on simulating a little better. Yeah, I honestly I didn't do a great job of simulating the actual test. Uh, and one of the I think the biggest thing was like the markers and using the, uh, right, the erasable right. markers and pads. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Um, I just like hadn't done that before taking the actual test, so that like. I don't know. I don't want to say it like threw me off, but it was definitely like a change. Um, like I said, I think having a sort of different environment um, ended up being kind of beneficial to me just because I don't know, I guess my response to that anxiety was to like focus in a little bit more. Right. Um, but it was a little bit, I also have really bad handwriting just personally. So that was something that was a little challenging during the test was dealing with uh, using those erasable markers. It's not as clean as, you know, actually using a pencil and paper. Right. Um, yeah. It, it ended up not being that big of a problem for me. That's good. Yeah, we've heard, we've heard that quite a bit. That uh, it's kind of like how you respond to that stress. So, um, mm -hmm. you know, for some people, right, they have something that goes off and they kind of freak out. So, as a general rule, right, probably better to like be completely comfortable, like uh, you know, like like why home team kind of advantage in sports, right, and that kind of thing. Like, oh, use the same marker, but like also being able to respond to any things that come up. You know, the the proctor does something a little funny, or you know, uh, don't freak out, right, <laughs> like. Uh, I, I honestly, my first time, I kind of freaked out. Like, uh, you know, I, I came back one minute late from break and and then maybe it messed me up a little bit. Still did fine, you know, but because I was so well prepared. I mean, that's the other thing is like with the TTP course, if you're um, or just, you know, whatever prep you're doing, if you're if you're if you know your stuff cold, like even if you do freak out, <laughs> even if your mind does go off a little like your knowledge is going to is going to, uh, you know, take over. Right. Um, is that is that kind of a factor too? Even where there was there ever a point? Uh, I mean, ideally not, but that you like maybe during the test there was a little bit of ups and downs in your psychology of like, uh, or were you able to stick, keep calm the whole time? Like, uh, or you know, with with when, whenever maybe you had a, a, a super challenging problem, was that? Uh, yeah. Let's talk oh about yeah, there's definitely a couple <laughs> problems that really threw me off. Um, yeah, yeah. And what I was really trying to stay focused on was like just don't spend too much time on it because I knew through my prep that was something that like. Like there's going to be questions that you don't know the answer to. And I was like, at a certain point, I just have to decide I'm not going to get this question. I can make as educated of a guess as possible, but it's time to move on so I can make sure I get all the other points. Um, so it was definitely something like I might get a, a quant problem that threw me off. I'd get a little freaked out for like a minute and then try to just circle back and be like, okay, just try to narrow this down to the reasonable answers, guess and move on. Um, so that was something I really tried to stay focused on was just like, don't get sucked into a problem because it's not worth spending five minutes trying to figure out a problem that I may or may not get. Um, especially if I can kind of narrow, like knock out a couple answers that are obviously incorrect and then guess between the two or three that remain. Exactly right. Yeah. Great point to not get, spend too much time. And, uh, you know, um, because right, even for that 770 score, you can miss, you, know, you can miss some questions. I think I've seen like for a, for a Q49 on an enhanced score report, I think uh, like 70% correct with around nine errors. So um, there is some leeway for that. I mean, the 50-51 is a little bit stricter and the V49 definitely that's like one error. Um, so, but I think I've also seen like around nine errors for a V40 as long as the questions are hard enough. So you do, you do, you know, even for these high scores, you don't have to be totally perfect. Um, you know, as you get up to 770, right, it does, it does get a little stricter with that. But um, yeah, there's definitely some questions in the chat I'd love to take. So um, you know, with you doing so amazing on the verbal, I'm sure people are curious on, uh, you know, what, what led to that? Um, you know, maybe you've done, you've done a lot of reading or something or a, a strong background. Um, but there are a couple of questions about improving sentence correction and how you were able to ace the reading comprehension. Oh, that's a, it's a good question. I, I frankly didn't do a whole lot of prep with, uh, with verbal just because, I mean, I started with a 46, so like I had right. a pretty good score to begin with and, my initial thought was like, if I end with a 46 on this and just improve my quant score, I'll be fine. Um, so really, I think the majority of the improvement I got from the on the verbal section was from what I was describing with like being a little bit more locked in with like the test day anxiety and stuff like that. 
Um, so I wish I had more information to offer about that score. Um, but frankly, that just wasn't something that I spent a whole lot of prep time on. Um, I wouldn't say there's anything like particularly strong in my background. Um, I've kind of, I guess I've always tested well in, uh, the verbal aspect of things, whether it's, you know, back in like the SAT, ACT in high school and that kind of stuff. Um, it's just kind of always like my strong suit in school. Um, cause I've always liked reading since I was a little kid, but there's it's not like there's anything super special. Right. Right. That makes sense. And I get the sense just from your approach and being de detail oriented and get, you know, being, uh, systematic about how you improved your quant. Um, one thing we definitely see is, and that I suspect with you is just like a, a strong attention to detail and precision. Like we, what we often see with test takers, it's like, it's about the knowledge, but it's also about the execution of like avoiding careless mistakes. Are you reading really carefully? Um, we definitely see it translate a lot from quant to verbal. So I think the fact that you were strong and verbal helped for quant. And then probably as you increase your quant, that's going to, you know, that's going to help for the verbal as well, even, even without studying it. Um, mm -hmm. I will help a little, um, give a couple tips here just, uh, in the chat for, um, the, the questions about sentence correction and reading comp. Um, I would say sentence correction, you got to know the rules. I, I like have this idea of like trigger words. So, um, so when you see certain things, you want to attack it right away, like uh, subject verb agree, you know, you see is versus are and all the splits, but then it's a matter of training and the course goes into a lot of detail and everything. Um, definitely like the, all the drills are really helpful. Um, you probably saw that Jacob, I think like, um, you know, with the course, I'm guessing, uh, like, you, did you do a lot of the lessons in addition to the, um, in addition to the chapter tests in terms of like one topic at a time and all the examples laid out? Um, with, yeah, with yeah, that, that was yeah. pretty much my strategy. I would like read through the chapter and then right. do the chapter test and then just kind of figure out what I need to revisit. Right, exactly. So yeah, in terms of these questions on sentence correction, reading comp, you can be really systematic with the course and topic by topic. Um, one thing that's that's additional with the sentence correction course is you have like little mini drills, um, whereas like the quant would be just full questions. So um, that's super helpful. And then reading comp, you want to get good at, um, yeah, there's a lot of like marker words. You can make it more mathematical, certain words. Um, but I'd say, yeah, go through the course on that one too and practice, you know, use the same principles that we're talking about here of like being systematic, learning from your mistakes, uh, definitely doing redos. It's a huge one. And um, yeah, I can also so, add, I think what yeah, I said ahead, earlier yeah, about yeah. Uh, like not getting hung up on a question for too long, like narrowing down to what are like the, the possible answers. Um, I guess I did do that a few times throughout the verbal section where I would like kind of be torn between two different responses. But then at a certain point, I'd be like, I've been looking at this for like two minutes. I just need to pick one of these two. Um, right, right. But yeah, I feel like that was a pretty common strategy I had was just like, okay, even though I don't feel 100% about what the right answer is, I can at least eliminate the ones that aren't the right answer. Exactly. Yeah. The process elimination is huge. Um, one other tip, I don't know if you use Jacob, but um, there's this idea like a finger technique with process of elimination where you you actually use a, like if you're right handed, you'd pull your pinky for uh, a mm. uh, B. Uh, uh, what is that? <laughs> Ring finger for B. And, and also all, all, so for sentence correction, it's super helpful. Like you see like B and D are, are gone and you just pull those right away and you kind of like set your hand on the table. That's like a nice little hack. Um, I found from uh, actually uh, GMAT club community many years ago, and that was super helpful. Hmm. So that does um, sound helpful. Yeah, yeah. So there's a lot of these little tricks, but the main thing is knowing your stuff. So um, yeah. So there's a question here that I that I, is really um, a good one. Um, did you did you go back to your error log and try solving them? Um, and it looks like yeah, this person's saying you know it can take a long time to go through your error log, and that, that's definitely true. I sympathize with that. I would say do it, you know, go through your, your air log is my suggestion. Um, you know, even if, even if it says, uh, it, it may take longer than, you know, that, that amount of time. Sorry about that. Um, but, uh, yeah. Any thoughts on that? Yeah. I'd say that was kind of the main strategy I had for my studying was just going back and looking at, um, problems that I had struggled with originally. Um, especially after I'd gone through them again, if they continued to give me a problem, I was like, okay, these are the ones that I need to focus on. Uh, these are the concepts that I'm, I'm like struggling with a little bit more. Um, so that was how I decided where to kind of focus my time. Um, I think one thing about that is it can be a little frustrating when you're spending all of your study time on the hard questions. It like feels really challenging because you're spending all your time with things that are challenging, right? Um, so that can definitely, it was a little bit frustrating because that was like, especially towards the end of my studying, that was more of my focus because I'd already gone through all the chapters um, and kind of knocked out everything that was quote unquote easy. Um, so yeah, that was definitely like, it made the the actual process of studying a little bit more frustrating, but I think the 
payoff really comes from there because that's where you get the most improvement. Yeah, exactly. That's a great point. And it's a common thing that like we often get the most benefit from the things that are the most frustrating, right? Because it's like more fun to do the thing you already know. And, you know, that, that's great. But we often have to like those working on those weaknesses, whatever it is in life, right? That's where we often get the greatest payoff. So so that's a really a great point. Um, do you have any other advice in terms of people feeling overwhelmed or disheartened at any point or, uh, you know, with the psychology involved or just any other tips in general um, for the process? Yeah, I would say, I know not everyone can do it, but I think that my strategy of like, just giving myself kind of unlimited time, like trying to knock the GMAT out early, not having a very specific, like it wasn't like, oh, I need to apply in the fall and have this score done by then. Like I knew I could take as much time as I needed. Um, that kind of helped because I never really felt too stressed out. I just always felt like if I just continue moving in a direction where I'm improving my score, eventually I'll get to a place where I'm happy with my score and that'll be that. Um, so I think if it's possible for, I know in some cases people are trying to apply by a certain deadline and you can't really do that. Um, but if you can kind of set yourself up to the point where you're like, I just need to move in a positive direction. And, you know, as long as I'm doing that, I feel good. Um, that was something that really helped alleviate the stress of like actually going into test prep on a day-to-day -day basis. It didn't really feel like something that was causing me a lot of stress while I was going through prep because I knew I had so much time. Right. No, that's a great point. And we definitely, um, encourage people to give themselves time, give themselves a backup, you know, definitely that's a good goal. Like you said before, of trying to knock it out the first time. Um, but we also, you know, encourage, uh, people, you know, it's good to have time. If you need to take a second test that takes the pressure off, definitely not, you know, it can be, uh, it works different for different people in terms of, you know, potentially setting an aggressive deadline for some people is helpful, but to not actually necessarily need it more like, um, wanting to get it done in a shorter time frame, right. Um, you know, just in terms of getting focus, it doesn't necessarily have to be, you know, whatever it's six months or four months or, or even a year, um, you know, having some sort of sense of it. But then I think having flexibility with it is really helpful because it's very hard to predict how long it is going to take you. Um, you can have some sense from your starting point, but um, yeah, it really varies a lot. So I think that's a definitely a, a really important point um, to give yourself time and, and not stress too much about it. Um, and, you know, being realistic about it, it is going to take a lot of work if you're, you know, have a, a large score increase and you have an ambitious goal, right? I, I have had people come to me, oh, I want 300 points in the next month. And it's like, well, I don't want to crush your dreams, but, you know, we've seen people increase a lot, you know, uh, but, you know, that, that you're probably going to take more time than that. So giving yourself time. Um, yeah. And, and I guess uh, we talked earlier about, you know, scheduling the test. Generally, I, I'd say once you've, you've taken the practice test and scored in that range. Um, on that note, you said you, you weren't totally sure, I think, when to take it. Did you actually take those mocks after you'd scheduled or before? And I think you said you took uh, one at the start and then two more after because uh, so, there was a mm -hmm. question here in the chat about how you spaced them out. Yeah. So I want to say I, I took one and then decided. So I took one at the very beginning. Um, and then as I was starting to feel like, OK, I got to the point where I was like, I need to just like take this test. I took a mock at that point to decide, like, do I feel like I'm in the right ballpark um, to just like actually go take this? Um, and I was satisfied with that score. So I was like, I'll just schedule the test. Hopefully I can prove a little bit. I think that was like a 720. Um, and then like right before the test, like the week before I took a, like a last mock just to get one last, you know, try in. Um, and that was the one I got a 750 on. So at that point I was like, okay, I'm totally good with this, with this test date. Totally happy with that. Um, so yeah, I guess I took three over the course of like my total studying. Um, uh, but I kind of, I guess I saved them more towards the end. I didn't really feel like it was going to be super beneficial to do that because a, I was mainly focused on my um, improving my quant score. So I didn't feel like doing the whole verbal section was a great use of my time. Um, and yeah, I just felt like the, the questions I was doing through TTP were, you know, they, at least, I don't know where you guys source the questions from, but I, they felt like real GMAT questions. So I didn't feel like it was super different um, whether I was taking them through TTP or through the actual test. And then by spending my time on TTP, I was able to, like I was mentioning earlier, like go look at the chapter for the question really easily versus with the actual mock test. It's not as easy to go then and say like, oh, I got this question wrong. Like what's the underlying concept I'm missing here? How do I go associate this with my the studying I was doing earlier and revisit it? Uh, right. So that's why I kind of, I didn't focus too much on the mocks. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. That's good. Um, yeah, so definitely like, yeah, I like that you, you know, got the score you're comfortable with and then then took it. Um, that makes a lot of sense. I think for some people, um, you know, it can be even be helpful to take 
more than the three, but also it is, you know, it's kind of a decision. There is only the six. Um, so the, the three, obviously you, you got like, you know, in your, in your target. And so that's, that's great. If you do have a little more time, maybe you take four or five. Um, but then the, the downside is if you do take all six before your first test, then there's no more. So, um, yeah. Um, I also wanted to highlight another thing you said, which is to, to take them at the end. That is what we encourage is like, um, if you were to take one just one month in and you needed, you know, three months to, to get through the material or, 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 or longer, like, um, so say you're only, you know, a couple chapters into the sentence correction, you take the test, you're still going to know, it's just going to show that you're still learning that. So it doesn't really, it's going to show you something you already know. Whereas if you've, you know, proven your mastery through the course first, then those, those tests and the sensor, especially since there's a scarcity of only six, that makes a lot of sense. And that is what we encourage. So, so yeah, I think, uh, you did a really good job on all, all that, obviously. Um, so I think there was a question, how long you used the course? It sounded like about a year, um, total. Yeah, it was a little, a little bit over bit. a year. Um, I did have some breaks in there, as I mentioned with traveling and starting my job. So I'd say it was like about a year in total. Okay, cool. Cool. Um, and there's a question about reading comprehension questions, uh, as st someone struggling. Um, I'll give a, pr a pretty quick overview. And then since you're pretty natural at it, I'm curious if you have any thoughts on, on reflecting. Um, I mentioned earlier, like some marker words, but I think really the most important thing is finding that I always encourage is finding the proof in the passage. So you have to like, you don't want to just go with what feels right. You have to actually go between the answer. And maybe you did this naturally, Jacob, and, and it helped you a lot. But um, you, you don't, it can't be on feel. It has to be like, it's asking you what is in the passage. So you need to like, uh, go to, you know, at, see exactly what the question's asking, find that spot in the passage and then cite it and go back and forth to the answer choices and, uh, you know, find, find what's actually proven. Um, and then there's, you know, a lot of more details in terms of language and, and noticing certain words. Like one of the best tips I got early on in my prep was the word, however, signals a contrast and it's really often signaling a main point. So there are a lot, a lot of details like these of like certain words that you can actually study if it doesn't come as naturally as it does for Jacob. Like a lot of people think, oh, like, I don't know that how I can improve. You definitely, we've seen people improve a ton and I was actually heavily involved in helping to write the the, the course for that. So we, we've seen a lot of progress with that. But um, any thoughts on that, Jacob, from your you know experience? Yeah, I will say, uh, so like you mentioned, I mean, a lot of the verbal stuff did feel a little bit more natural to me. I think especially the sentence correction stuff. Um, but it, it, that was something I had to kind of wrap my head around with the reading comprehension was sometimes there would be um, multiple responses that like feel correct. Like it might be something that you think is a true statement just based on your own knowledge of the world. Uh, but then you do have to kind of look back at the passage and see what's actually proven, what's substantiated in there. Like what are they actually talking about in the passage? Um, so that was an area where I had to kind of like control my, my impulse of like what the right answer might be and be like, okay, I actually need to go back and like look at this pretty thoroughly and make sure this is right. Because in sentence correction, I think what feels or what sounds right uh, took me a long way. Um, but in reading comprehension, that could actually be misleading. Um, and I think originally I was missing some questions because of that. That's right. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Yeah, definitely um, not using what's in your head is a, is a key point. Um, sticking to what's in the passage and then going back and checking. And then um, it sounds like for you, your ear was good on the sentence correction. We, that it can be really good for people uh, sometimes, but sometimes like not, there are some traps in there. So people yeah. watch out. Like you also do have to watch out that like there can be some awkward sounding things that are actually okay. So that may need some tuning person to person of like, can't always trust your ear. Right. So, yeah. so, but it sounds I like was yours was pretty good to, start with. To, yeah. to get adjusted to the, yeah. like the GMAT style of right, writing. Right. Um, Cause right. it is a little different from what just sounds like natural, but I feel like I did after doing some like practice tests and stuff, it, it started to, I was like, okay, I get what they're, what they're kind of going for now. So it did take some adjusting. Yeah, yeah. And there was a question here. Yeah, sorry we missed it earlier. I did want to get to this about um, feeling overwhelmed at looking at a lengthy question, um, losing yourself, how to control your mind, um, managing anxiety during the test, especially for questions that appear daunting. So yeah, I, I, I really wanted to get to this one. Um, any thoughts? I have a couple of thoughts, but Jacob, you want to start us off on that one? Yeah, I could definitely understand like the idea of uh, when a question is really long, it's like, Sometimes I just would like look at it, especially when I was doing practice tests and stuff and just be like, where do I even begin to like process all the information that's in here? Um, and that could be kind of a, a frustrating experience. Um, like I was mentioning, I feel like the actual like test day environment, um, I, it helped me focus a lot. And I think the main aspect was it made those questions a little easier to deal with because 
I kind of felt like, okay, there isn't time to like feel like I don't want to actually dive into this question. I just have to like get started. Um, and so I think that's actually an area where I was able to channel some of the pressure of the uh, test day environment into having an easier experience. But I definitely remember like, especially when I was doing the mock tests and like getting towards the end and some like really long question would pop up with all this different information. Um, it would, yeah, I would definitely get that feeling of like, oh man, this is going to be hard. Um, so yeah, I think that's one, one area where I was especially able to kind of channel the, the test day pressure into uh, a benefit. That's right. And then how often would you say that you ended up having to, were there any that you just had to guess based on time pressure? I know it can be tough. So there is a balance there of like, if you do have the time, it's great to push through. And maybe that question takes only three minutes and another question takes one minute and you can get through. But then, you know, potentially, right, um, if you are behind on time, maybe you just have to let a question go, you know, depending on your score goal. Because, um, right, if, you know, we have seen like, right, if you're starting off strong, you know, someone missing nine questions on, and of hard questions, if as long as they're hard questions, it's still scoring a 49. So there is this delicate balance there. But um, what was your position on any guesses or or having to let a question go? I think you mentioned something about that earlier, but if we want to. Uh, yeah, I think, I mean, there weren't any questions I had to take like a wild guess on. Uh, there were definitely some where I might've narrowed it down to like two options or three options. Right. And been like, right. okay, I'm not really sure how to select between these. Um, so yeah, at, at a certain point, like I mentioned earlier, my strategy was like, if I know I'm between two questions and I can, or between two answers rather, and I can spend another two minutes trying to narrow it down. But at this point, maybe it's better just to, to guess one of them. Um, so yeah, that is something I've wondered about is I wonder like uh, of those that I kind of took a guess on, like I wonder how many of them I just guessed correctly. Um, right. Like I said, Pro I, probably I was always shooting between like two. Right, right, right. Well, your hunch probably was right. And there, there can be a little bit of luck involved right there with, you know, on the verbal, if you are between two, right. But uh, you know, it's, it's, it's 90, you know, like usually 95% skill or, or more. Right. Because like, mm -hmm. um, I mean, but yeah, there is a factor of like that. That is one reason why, um, you know, your, your score could fluctuate a little bit up and down, right? Especially that verbal 49, one question versus two questions. Maybe that's a 45 with two errors or 46, right? So um, so that that is why that potentially giving yourself like multiple takes, right? If you have a bad day, then you have that option. And we, we hope that we have a good day and, and you know, all that mental training and all the training pays off, right? But even, you know, Michael Jordan misses shots, right? Uh, you know, I think at one point there's a quote about that, right? I've missed more shots than than anyone, or like a Gretzky's quote, right? You miss you miss 100 of the shots you don't take. So yeah, so uh, that's another more encouragement to uh, you know get after it and uh, at the very start for people early on, you know, take that first uh, first practice test and get it get a sense and get some get the ball rolling on it. Um, let's see, there's a few. Um, let's see here. Uh, what reference materials? Uh, yeah, we've been talking about the target test prep course. Um, if you need extra questions, you know, uh, leading up to the course, once you've completed the course, you can use official guide and also the mba.com six practice tests. Um, there's a question here about music. Um, is it, you know, beneficial or positive? I think you mentioned something about music. Uh, was it in the library or something? Or um, I, I, yeah. my, my response was going to be, it's kind of personal preference on music, but uh, what was your comment on that? Yeah, I was saying like I whenever I was studying like throughout uh, the whole year I was doing my studying, I would generally listen to music unless I was like watching videos or something like that. And so that was something I realized towards the end. I was like, oh, man, I'm not going to be able to listen to music during the actual test. And I've been doing 100 percent of this prep with music. So like I hope that's not going to be an issue. Um, so I think the very last mock I did, I tried to do it without listening to music, which was felt really boring. But I was like, I need to at least have one experience of taking right. some of these questions right. just because it does feel different. Right. Like having. Uh, like audio input. And then obviously on the actual day of the test, um, at least in my experience, I was in like a room with other people taking tests and I had, they just had these like noise canceling headphones. Um, right. So I used those. And then that was just like, like negative noise. I and mean, that's like literally nothing. So that was like right, right, right. such a different experience. So I think it was helpful to at least have taken the one mock without listening to music and, and kind of adjusting to that. Cause it does feel right. pretty different. Right. Um, so yeah, I would definitely recommend at least doing that and probably going a little beyond that and, and testing out the, the markers because that, that did feel pretty different right. as well. Yeah, it totally makes a lot of sense. So I would say, yeah, do what you're comfortable with throughout the prep. But then as you get closer, you do want to simulate and definitely on practice tests, simulate as much as possible. Um, so and, and I, I mean, even with your practice, your your sets, if the more you can get into that mindset of like I'm competing, sure, it's going to be more amped up on a full practice test or the actual test. but the more you can kind of channel that competitive uh, 
but relax at the same time. It's kind of this ba fine balance, right? Of like intensity, but also calm, not, not too stressed. So like, kind of like I said before, maybe that activation level of like a six and then channeling that excitement and making it a game. Um, and on that note, I'm actually curious, like um, one thing we've talked about sometimes with people is to like really celebrate your wins and your streaks psychologically. And um, you know, how many in a row can you get? Um, so maybe tell us a little bit about your accuracy levels and you know whether they fluctuated, but in anything you did to like keep your motivation and celebrate your wins as you went. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good question. I guess um, when I was doing, when I was following through like the chapters in the TTP course, um, you know, you could set like your target score. And then I think that determines what throughout the, the practice, the, the chapter tests, like what the targets are for the easy, medium and hard test. I'm not sure if that actually changes based on what you set your target score to be or not, um, since I never changed that. Um, well, that was yeah, kind of the baseline does, yeah. that I used. Okay, that makes sense. That's what I'd been assuming. And so I was like, as I'm working through these chapters, um, I assume that if I can hit these benchmarks, uh, that I'm on the path to a score that I'll be happy with. So that was kind of what I used to ground myself while I was studying throughout, especially because, you know, as you go through some of the, the more difficult chapters, I mean, the hard questions can be really hard. Um, and so while on the surface, I wouldn't feel great about like getting only 60% of the questions right. I was like, okay, well maybe I only need to get 60% of the questions right. So this isn't actually like bad. Um, it's just kind of a different frame of mind from when you're normally studying. You don't want to get 60% of questions, right? You need right. to do better than that. But right. so I guess I appreciated that the questions were, were grounded in that sort of the benchmark that I, I knew what I was aiming for with each of those tests. Um, and then that also made getting 70% of hard questions, right? Feel really great. Um, so yeah. Exactly. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. And celebrating those successes and, you know, encouraging yourself and then retake them if you aren't hitting your marks. Right. So, so that's really good. Yeah. Um, Let's see, there was a question about uh, timing. Um, how do you mentally keep a tab of time spent per questions? Does the official exam show the time spent per question? Um, so first off, uh, it does not show the time spent per question. Um, I think in certain modes on the, on the, in the course, you can see it. So you can have some awareness around that. I mean, you, I would say look also after, uh, after you've taken the, t you know, test and get a sense after you take a, a a test, um, you know, look at the timing. Um, the new version of MBA.com now does show the timing better than it used to um, a while ago. And, um, but any thoughts on the pacing and, um, you know, throughout your prep was, was, was pacing an issue um, or, you know, both on full tests and also like individual questions. Um, any thoughts? Yeah. Yeah, that's an interesting question. So I'd say when I was doing um, prep and just like going through the chapter tests, like trying to learn each chapter, I tried not to get too hung up on the times. Um, like I think someone asked if I stuck to the time limits during the practice test. I really didn't because I figured it would be better to like actually learn the underlying material at that point and then worry about the pacing later, um, which I think was a good strategy. Um, and then when I was doing the mock tests and the actual test, I didn't really focus too much on how much time I was spending per question because I knew like, Obviously, some questions are going to be easier and I want to get them done faster to make time so I can spend extra time right. on the ones that are more challenging. So I tried not to like, like I was just trying to get them done as quickly as possible, really, but not focusing on like, oh, I have two minutes to complete the question and I'm going totally. to like use all of that time or limit totally, myself totally. that time. Um, I guess I would try to check in like, oh, I'm halfway through the questions. Like, where am I out on time? But it's like, okay, I can slow down a little bit. But I try to keep it more at that general level of like checking in every so often to see where I was at versus like worrying too much about specific questions. I do also think that after taking um, the mock test and doing so many like practice tests with TTT, I just had a kind of general sense of, you know, oh, I'm spending too long on this question. Like it feels like it's been three minutes. Like I just need to move on. But I didn't really have like any sort of hard line. And I'd say also an aspect of that is like realizing when I'm getting diminishing returns on how much time I'm spending. Like exactly. if it's been two minutes, but I feel like I'm almost arriving at an answer, like, okay, I'd rather spend the next 30 seconds on it. But if I feel like I'm kind of spinning my wheels, like I'm not making any progress on eliminating farther down from like two options, for example, at that point, I'm like, okay, it's time to move on. This isn't worth my time. But it's definitely, uh, I think, more of an art than a science in terms of timing. Yeah, totally, totally. And that's a great point that I wanted to emphasize as well about uh, um, the, the sunk cost potentially. So the, the diminishing returns point. So a lot of people... Um, it's not necessarily about hitting like two minutes each question, right? So there's different, basically I call it like part-times, like a, like a golf analogy for different questions. So a nice thing about the course is you'll have like an average time for everyone, might be three minutes on a really long, hard problem. Same thing for official questions. 
and the average time might be only 55 seconds on a shorter question. That shorter question might even have traps. So maybe it's a hard question, but it's just a lot shorter. Um, you know, so there's different types of difficulty in terms of is there like a trap answer or just a really long question. Um, but uh, definitely like if you're close and you've still spent a long time, I'd say finish that question. If you need to guess on a long looking one, better to guess right away. Um, and so, you know, you're much better off getting one out of two, right? With, you know, four minutes on one, zero minutes on the other, then, you know, uh, right, three minutes on both and, and, and guessing both, you know, but running out of time, right? So, um, so that is an important thing there um, of managing it. And I would also say your idea of like checking on the time in a more general sense is good. Um, personally, I like to have like kind of a little bit more specific benchmarks, like, um, but you don't want to get too lost in them. So basically for every, it's two minutes per question on the quant. So basically every um, five questions, you know, you have 10, 10 minutes less. So basically if you start with 62 minutes, then 50, you know, after 10 questions, you're down to 42, 20 questions, you're down to 22. And so the, the time, yeah, managing the time definitely is, um, you know, the more that that's an issue for you, the more you'll want to be taking practice tests and as, but more towards the end of your prep. So I think you did it perfectly um, in terms of not stressing too much on the time at first, but um, it can be helpful if those times are really high to go back and redo if that's an issue for you. So uh, there was a question earlier about re redos taking more than, you know, time than they wanted. I would say it just takes what it takes and don't worry about it taking, you know, a short amount of time. I'd say, you know, take the time that you need to redo um, mistakes, guesses, slow, things that are low confidence. And that makes a huge difference. So, um, yeah, any other, I think one other question came up was just, you know, any other um, like favorite advice on how to ace the test? I think we've covered a lot here, um, but uh yeah. Any other things that come to mind, you know? <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, I think the point that we were just talking about is pretty important, like not getting too hung up on the timing when you're in like the earlier, like learning kind of review phase of just going through all the different concepts that are going to be on the test. Um, that was something that was important for me is like just making sure I was more focused on actually learning. Um, like I felt like I was doing more learning than test prep at that point. And I think that was something that was important um, for my journey. Um, and then, like I said before, I mean, I know it's not possible for everybody, but I know it helped me a lot to not feel like time pressure in terms of when I was going to take the test. Um, and that really helped me to feel like, you know, just moving in a positive direction every day, every week, uh, was good enough for me. I didn't feel like, uh, I had a deadline I was imposing on myself. Um, so that made the, the journey much more, I guess, enjoyable. Um, and also just alleviated a lot of the stress on test day because I knew, even though I didn't want to come back and take the test again, like I mentioned, I knew that was on the table. Um, I didn't, it wasn't like my last opportunity or anything like that. So that was something that really helped to alleviate uh, a pressure just throughout the entire experience. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. And the mantra we often say is, to, you know, take it when you're ready. Uh, take it when you've, you've proven your mastery and that you're in your score range. So that's definitely great. And taking the stress off, trying to enjoy it as much as possible. Um, actually, one other topic we could get a little bit into was uh, that, that we didn't quite so much as like your, your motivation. Um, like did that, um, I mean, you talked a little bit at the start, but were there like, were there any times where maybe, I guess it sounds like you didn't put too much pressure, so it wasn't too much stress, but um, was like kind of thinking more, meditating on your why behind this helpful in terms of, you know, helping you put the time in and, and everything. And uh, cause like a lot mm. of times for students, especially if they are on a shorter timeline and they really have to like go super hard, right? Then it is, uh, you know, they really have to sacrifice a lot. It sounds like for you, maybe that wasn't quite as bad, but I do encourage people to really meditate on their why and, and get it, you know, that, that whole exercise that's often encouraged of, I even encourage people to journal like on their why, both for the things they learn on the test and things that for their MBA, their bigger mission. So both the micro and the macro and curious, any thoughts on, on that for you or, or just in, in general? Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's a good point. That was definitely something I tried to keep in mind. Um, like I said, I mean, I'm not very, I haven't really started like applying to MBA programs or anything, but this whole process to me was about like setting myself up for success in the future. Um, so like I mentioned, like I knew I wanted to go to an MBA program eventually. So my thought was like, I can just get this test out of the way now and then I can open doors up for myself um, in the future. Uh, and that was something that, that really helped me stay motivated. I also kind of clung on to the idea of, even though I didn't have a specific time limit of when I wanted to take the test, I guess what prevented me from procrastinating were the two aspects of like a wanting to do it as close to having graduated as possible because I still had that kind of test taking studying mentality and I didn't want to kind of lose track of that. Um, 
And then B, I knew like as I was starting a new job, I was like, things are only going to get busier from here. I'm only going to have more responsibilities as uh, as I get older. Um, so I was like, it, it's just going to be so much better to get this out of the way um, while I'm early in my career, kind of fresh out of school. So that was something I, I kind of kept thinking about. And that was when I, I mentioned that I, I was kind of struggling to pick a test date and just kind of get it done. That was also something that I was thinking about was just wanting to get it done before things kind of started picking up at my work and stuff like that. Right. That's great. And I'm curious, is there anything that you did to try to make it more enjoyable, either with the, the, the structure of the TTP course or just your own mindset involved in terms of mm -hmm. like trying to get into that mindset of like making it a game, maybe, you know, going for streaks, for examples, or, you know, celebrating successes. But that is, you know, something that uh, the more you can make it as fun as possible, right? <laughs> because, uh, you know, um, and and the more competent you get, right, that, you know, it feels better, like those learnings, right? Uh, seeing the progress, um, praising that progress, I think people find really helpful. Uh, just curious, any any thoughts on that? Yeah, I kind of mentioned earlier um, that it was helpful for me to feel like just making any progress in the right direction was good. Like I didn't feel pressure to get to a certain point by uh, a certain date or anything like that. Um, I think that the target, I mentioned this earlier, uh, of the structure of TTP felt very like linear. Um, and I felt like I could just kind of, whenever I was ready to study, just kind of open up my computer and go to the next lesson. And th there was always like a logical next step. Of right, 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 right. Totally. Um, I think for me, something that kind of, and I think this is just generally true, uh, when you don't know what the next step is supposed to be, that leads to a lot of procrastination. So I think always knowing like, I have a next step lined up, I know what I'm supposed to do next was helpful. Totally. Um, and then, you know, TTP also has like throughout the, as you go through the chapters, like it'll kind of bring up review tests and stuff like that. So I felt very confident that like, I didn't really need to do anything beyond what the structure of the program was providing. Uh, so I always felt like I could just move on to the next thing. Um, and then I would, as long as I was kind of putting one foot in front of the other, I'd be in a good place. Uh, so that mentality helped me to, it made it a lot easier to just like sit down every day and, and just kind of knock out my studying for the day or for the week or whatever it may have been. Um, so yeah, I think having a structure was, was super helpful to me. Yeah, that's probably the thing, the thing we hear the most helpful in, in general and with the course is to have that structure, have that plan, know what you're doing. Um, there is the science behind it. I'll just explain briefly in general, but of like an implementation intention. So if you know what you're going to do and when, like your, your, your odds of actually completing that, it's like skyrockets. It's interesting, like for workouts, there's a study that went from like, I think I read this on uh, Atomic Habits blog, which is also a great book um, and blog for everyone. Uh, but the, the odds of like completing that workout maybe went from like 30% to like 95. So same concept with your study plan. Like, you know, let's use the things that work for in other disciplines. Right. And uh, try and apply it, uh, you know, uh, you know, things from real real life, you know, <laughs> to, the, to the test. And actually, that brings me to another question. Do you did you have any background with like sports or anything like that? Uh, or just you said you were pretty good at tests. But um, do you feel like any kind of like sports psychology type or mindfulness or anything like that um, in terms of being able to focus better. And, and it sounds like you were able to handle the stress of the test pretty well without like having to do a million, a million practice tests or anything, but uh, you know, you handled mm -hmm. it really well, it sounds, but uh, any thoughts on, on that? Yeah, it's an interesting question. Um, <laughs> also real quick, I thought it was funny that you mentioned atomic habits because I think that's where oh, okay. the idea I brought up came from was from reading that book. Oh, cool, um, cool. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if there's really any tie to sports psychology. Um, the only sport I really do right now is rock climbing. I'm pretty into oh, that. Oh, amazing. Okay. That does kind of help in a lot of different ways just in terms of staying focused. Um, I never really thought too much about how that would have connected to like my test taking experience, but that is definitely like uh, a sport that kind of requires you to get into a flow state a lot. And I think that that translates, you know, now that I yeah, think about it, yeah, directly totally. into the experience of taking right, a right. test. Um, so yeah, that is a good point. Like, I do wonder if that had any sort of effect on, on my mentality. It, it, pro it probably did. Yeah. That's probably. that flow state. What he's talking about. Um, there's some really good books on this too. Um, with, uh, I think it's, uh, Stephen Kotler. Um, you could look him up on podcasts and stuff, but that flow state is when we're, um, in that ideal focus state where, you know, it's like a, in the zone is what they call it for sports. Um, and yeah, it makes a huge difference in terms of, uh, being able to execute at a high level. So so I think that that probably did help. And uh, that idea in general of like translating what you're good at, maybe if you aren't as good at test taking in general, you know, and but you are good at other things in sport, uh, you know, say a sport, um, I've often encouraged people to try and really channel that. There's even like another tutor that I met. He like does this. There's this idea of like an alter ego effect. So there's even a book on this. What like Beyonce, when she was young, she it's kind of interesting, like she was shy, but then she channeled like Sasha Fierce. And it's like a Mamba mentality for Kobe. And there's a lot of these athletes, they channel like 
uh, this like uh, superhero kind of. So for my mm -hmm. friend, he, he would channel like American Sniper, like being ultra precise and have like certain mantras. So, um, you know, it can work with or without that, right? <laughs> but there are these like little details that you can try, you know, that, um, so, so for me, like I, my little mantra I would say is like, I'm sharp, focused, precise, really keying in on that precision. Um, it sounds like you were probably doing that pretty naturally in terms of like, uh, at least on the, you know, the verbal to start off and then getting into that mindset of like being really precise. But um, I think any, any kind of like uh, way you can channel your best self, you know, really is a, is a really helpful. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. I think for me, it was like, especially on the actual day of the test and you're feeling a lot of extra pressure and stuff. I'm like, okay, I've just done two mock tests and been happy with the score. Like right. I know how to do this. I just, you know, retaining the idea of like, if I just, I just need to perform to my own level and like, I know I'll be fine. Right. Um, you're keeping that in mind of like, I know I'm prepared. I know, I know enough of these questions to get a score I'm happy with. Uh, that was helpful to kind of stay grounded. Totally. And, uh, how did it feel when you saw that 770 and, and what was the original goal? So that, I mean, it must've, <laughs> well, I'll let you, yeah. you explain it, but that's, that's pretty awesome. Yeah. I was pretty surprised. Uh, because like I said, like the last mock I took, I got like a 750 and I was like, okay, I probably did a little better on that because I'm like, you know, taking it in a calm environment. I'm using my pencil and paper instead of the, the marker. So I thought I'd do a little bit like not as good. And then honestly, like when I was taking the test, I didn't feel like it was going well. Like there was a few questions I felt like were really tripping me up. Um, I felt stressed. Like I didn't really, I it did not expect that I was going to have done better. I was like, how far below that 750 would I have scored at? Um, so I was frankly very surprised um, when I saw the score pop up, but it was definitely a good feeling. Um, but yeah, it was, uh, like I said, I, I didn't, I didn't really expect for the test day anxiety to actually be something that was beneficial to me, but it, it, I guess it did end up being pretty helpful. Um, I think I just kind of stayed a little more locked in. Maybe the questions that I felt tripped up about, I was feeling like I did know the answer, but I was second guessing myself right, because right, of right. all the pressure and stuff like that. So yeah, I, I don't know exactly what to attribute it to. Um, right. But yeah, definitely. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. And it's maybe that, you know, the, the, uh, the flow state, you know, kicked in. I think that's that again, that mindset of getting excited about it, letting that adrenaline help you like, mm -hmm. uh, and actually a more specific thing on that is like, if you do feel the stress, like you can tell yourself like, um, oh, this is, this is like my body helping me activate, like helping me get into an ideal state. Um, there's this amazing Ted talk on it. Um, the upside of stress that I highly recommend for everyone. So, um, yeah, it's like 50 million views or 40 million. So I would, I would look that up as well. Um, we're almost out of time, but, um, there were a couple more quick questions and then we'll we'll jump off. Um, so there was a question about the AWA, the SA. I would say, don't worry about it too much. It's way less important. I would say just get a sense of, um, you wanna have a template for it. Um, it does go into some more detail in the course. Um, what I'm, Basically what I did is I had a template and I just was able to quickly hash out you know three problems with it, had the, the template for the first and last paragraph and uh, not worry too much, but there are like um, score calculators out there. You can just get a sense if you're in the range. Maybe you need like probably better to air probably, you know, so you're at least in mid range and not super low. Um, and then adaptive. Um, oh yeah. So there's a question. How does it feel adaptive? Do you feel anxious if you suddenly get easier questions after hard ones? Was that an issue for you at Jacob at all? Um, thinking that way? Yeah. Yeah, it's kind of, uh, again, like a double-edged sword because on the one hand, it allows you to think, like when you get a really hard question, you kind of have like the initial panic of like, oh no, I don't know how to answer this question. But then you're like, okay, wait, it's a good thing that I'm getting a good this thing. difficult question. Right. Um, and then there is the flip side of you get an easy question and you're like, oh great, this is easy. I know how to do this. And then you're like, wait, why did I just get this question? Uh, what happened on the last one? Right. So I, I tried to tune it out. It was definitely something that was popping into my head. Um, but yeah. Um, like I said, it can, it can go both ways. It can be helpful and not helpful, but I tried to keep in mind, like, I don't really know how the GMAT's algorithm worked or how it was selecting these questions or also like what the GMAT might consider hard or easy, maybe different from what I consider hard or easy. So I tried to just kind of like tune out that noise. Um, but it definitely can be easier said than done to tune out that noise. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Easier said than done. And great point. You, you do want to turn it out, tune it out. And it does helpful to just know that the, the, the question difficulty spikes up and down. It totally does. There's a general trend, but like, right, like uh, there were some simulations done, posted online where someone like, out of like scoring a 49, they had like 12 quote hard questions, like rated, you know, from stats, GMAT club stats. And they got one out of those 12, right? And that ended up in a 49. So like, like, but throughout that whole time, that difficulty was up and down, up and down, like trending up. But anyway, so don't, don't think about that. <laughs> 
really don't think about that. And like you said, if it's a hard one, don't freak out. You know, it is probably a good sign. But like, I wouldn't definitely don't think of it as a bad sign if you get an easy one, because they will just feel easier or weaker. So we are right about out of time. But um, Jacob, uh, you know, congrats again on everything. And do you have any last advice for, for everyone uh, before we jump off? I know you've, you've, um, you've pretty, we've gone through almost everything. But if you do have any final words, you know, if you do or don't, um, you know, that's great. Yeah, again, like I've, I've been saying, uh, I think just doing everything you can to, to give yourself as much time as possible, like not putting too much pressure on myself was something that really helped throughout the whole experience, like knowing that um, I could give myself more time if I didn't do well on the test, you know, there'd always be another opportunity to do it. Um, like I said before, I know that's not the case for everybody. You can't always do it um, if you do have some sort of deadline you're trying to meet. But I think if you're kind of earlier in the stage of like preparing for the test or considering starting, um, doing what I did and consider and uh, giving yourself as much time as possible. Um, it was definitely super helpful for my experience. So I recommend that's, doing that if you can. <laughs> that's all great advice. Uh, thanks so much, Jake, Jacob, and congrats again. And just one last thing, please, please, uh, if you like the video, please like, subscribe, and put any comments. Um, one question for you uh, would be, uh, if you could put in the comments, what did you find most helpful today? I think everyone else would really benefit from that. Um, seeing what you found most helpful. And uh, we'd be really interested to hear. So thanks again and have a great day and best of wishes with your prep. Thanks. Thanks, okay. everyone. Bye-bye.